Hi everyone and welcome to another marvelous video. Making a sci-fi film is often a challenging task. From its story, which not only needs to be entertaining but also backed with near acceptable scientific logic, to its execution of making the ideas look real, the imaginations and surrealism demand exquisite cinematographic skills, which, when perfected, create unforgettable scenes and stories. In today's video, we will be talking about every well-crafted deep sci-fi movie till date. Stay with us till the end, as we will be going through an interesting list. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey, made in nineteen sixty eight. Nineteen sixty eight's Two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey is one of the earliest science fiction films that laid the foundation for many directors and filmmakers. The surrealism and visuals were of high depth, and it is still hard to believe that Stanley Kubrick made the film the year before man first landed on the moon. The film begins with a tribe of hominins during prehistoric Earth. As they loitered around their waters, a rival tribe arrived and chased them away. The tribe wandered off to a new place where, the next day, they found an alien monolith held firmly on the ground. The tribe learned how the bones of other deceased animals could be used as weapons, and they soon returned to their waters and drove away the rival tribe and reoccupied it. The scene shifted to millions of years in the future, where Dr. Haywood Floyd, chairman of the United States National National Council of Astronautics was shown to be traveling to the Clavius base established on the moon. He addressed a meeting with other scientists about the appearance of a strange monolith on the moon. As they were taking photographs, the monolith emitted a powerful radio signal and the scene shifted to 18 months later, where an American spacecraft named Discovery was on its way to Jupiter. The mission was headed by scientists Dr. Dave Bauman and Dr. Frank Poole, with three more in cryosleep. Most of the spacecraft operations were taken care of by HAL, a HAL 9000 computer with a human-like personality. However, things took a turn when HAL went rogue and executed operations that led to the death of the three scientists in their cryosleep. When Frank left the spaceship to terminate HAL's systems from the mainframe, HAL cut down his oxygen supply, leading to his death. Dave tried retrieving Frank's body, but HAL made sure no one entered back into the spacecraft. However, Dave managed to get into the spacecraft, following which he successfully disconnected most of HAL's circuits despite its plea. Soon a video of Haywood began playing, which stated that the main objective of their mission was to investigate the radio signal sent from the monolith to Jupiter. Once Discovery arrived near Jupiter, Dave found a massive monolith orbiting around the planet. He left the spacecraft in an EVA pod, but was soon sucked into a vortex of colored light moving past him at high speed. At the end of it, Dave found himself in a sizable neoclassical bedroom along with older versions of himself. While a middle-aged version of him was eating dinner, another old and bedridden Dave was on his bed, pointing towards the monolith in front of his bed. Soon, the old Dave transformed into a fetus, enclosed in a glowing bubble that could be seen floating in space above Earth. This was the end of the movie, and it was open-ended for audiences to make their own judgments. However, Stanley Kubrick, in an interview, explained that the idea of the ending was to showcase that a godlike entity of high intelligence took Dave in without any shape or form. The place he was kept in was more like a human zoo where his entire life passed. The film's way of expression was unique and its surrealism was state of the art and the United States Library of Congress selected the film for preservation in the National Film Registry. Vibration and G levels are in the green. Contact from 1997. Directed by Oscar winner Robert Zemeckis, 1997's Contact was an American science fiction drama film based on Carl Sagan's 1985 novel. The story revolves around Dr. Ellie Arroway, 
a worker at a search for extraterrestrial intelligence program at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. She was always a science enthusiast and her work involved observing radio emissions from space in hopes of finding extraterrestrial life forms. Despite the president's science advisor, David Drumlin, considering the program futile and stopping its funding, billionaire industrialist S.R. had an over to pit and provided all the funds necessary and also a workspace at the very large area in New Mexico. One day, Dr. Arroway and her team noticed chatter originating from Star Vega. However, when the chattering was revealed to be an encoded video of Adolf Hitler's opening address at the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin, Germany, it was confirmed that this was the first ever transmission that was able to cross the ionosphere, travel to Vega and return to Earth. Soon, politicians, military, religious leaders and other rival scientists tried to take away Dr. Arroway and her team's findings. But Mr. Haddon proved the means to decode the signals, which contained 63,000 pages of encoded data. It had the schematics of a machine that could be a form of transportation to Vega. Soon, multiple investors across nations contributed the funding necessary to build the machine, and an international panel was established to select a candidate to travel in it. Drumlin was selected, but a terrorist arrived and destroyed the machine and killed Drumlin. It was the second machine built by the United States in which Dr. Arroway traveled with a recording device. Upon approaching Vega, she found a civilization with a figure resembling her deceased father, whom she recognized as an alien. It was revealed that humanity contacted them, and they were a species worth being shown the first step to the cosmos. When Dr. Arroway arrived and revealed the details, it was considered false as the recording simply showed static. The entire the project was declared a hoax designed by Haddon. Although static, the recordings were of 18 hours, for which Dr. Arroway received funding for the SETI program at VLA. It was another sci-fi film received well by critics and mainstream audiences. It won the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation and several Saturn Awards. Europa Report 2013's Europa Report was an American found footage film showcasing the events of the first crewed mission to Europa, one of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. Written by Philip Gelat and directed by Sebastian Cordero, the story begins with the CEO of Europa Ventures, Dr. Samantha Unger, narrating the story of the Europa mission embarked on by six astronauts. The mission was privately funded with the objective of finding extra terrestrial life on Europa. Six months after their departure, the ship encountered a solar storm which damaged all communication systems and Chief Engineer Andre Block and Junior Engineer James Corrigan left the ship on an EVA to check on the systems. While an accident took place, Corrigan's suit got ripped and infected with hydrazine, which could contaminate the spaceship. Block tried his best to save him, but Corrigan pushed Black into the airlock and drifted away into space, eventually dying. Mortally wounded, the team finally arrived on Europa 20 months later. They missed their landing spot but landed anyway. They noticed the presence of a single-celled organism, but before much evidence could be collected, the crew members began facing their demise. Chief Science Officer Daniel Luxemburg fell into the ice below, and although she died, a camera kept recording her fall and how the blue bioluminescence was reflected in her eyes. As the rest tried escaping, their ship began malfunctioning and they sacrificed their life support to communicate with Earth and send them all the collected data. Before the last member of the crew died, the bioluminescent was revealed to be that of a six-tentacled creature. With a budget of less than $10 million, the film bagged almost $1,300,000 at the box office. The futuristic imagery and concept caught the likes of all. The concept was meticulously crafted and despite having a predictable story, it was certainly a movie worth watching even now.
Moon, based on a story by Duncan Jones, 2009's Moon was a sci-fi film showcasing the malpractices of humans after discovering resources on the far side of the moon. It was monopolized by Lunar Industries after they discovered an alternative for oil. The world was in an oil crisis and Lunar Industries managed to mine helium-free on the moon, which was the replacement. The facility on the moon was completely automatic and needed a single human to maintain the proper functioning of the machines. The man charged with the duty was Samuel Bell, who was shown to be completing his three-year contract. However, two weeks before his return to Earth, Sam started getting unwell and began having hallucinations. His distraction caused him to crash his lunar rover into the harvester, and he soon fell unconscious. When he got back to his senses, he found his AI Gertie communicating with Lunar Industries on Earth, who assured him that a rescue team was on its way to fix the harvester. Growing suspicious, Sam travelled to the point where the lunar rover had crashed and noticed another Sam wounded and unconscious. Nursing him back to health, the truth was revealed that all of these were clones of Sam who were programmed to survive for three years, following which they were discarded and another was activated. As the story progressed, the two tried jeopardizing the illegal practices of Lunar Industries. In the end, a new clone was activated and sent back to Earth. While the arriving team from Lunar Industries were fooled by the old Sam lying on conscious in the broken harvester. The new Sam, when reached, revealed the illegal practices of the company, leading to their prosecution. Moon is one of the rare assets of the sci-fi film genre, exceptionally well executed with above-par cinematography and direction. Sam Rockwell's multiple roles suit perfectly, and it is definitely a must-watch for sci-fi lovers. The Andromeda Strain from 1971 1971's Andromeda Strain was based on Michael Crichton's 1969 novel of the same name, which revolved around the mysterious events witnessed by the elite scientist Dr. Jeremy Stone. It all started after a US government satellite crashed near a small rural town of Piedmont, New Mexico. The event was followed by the death of all its residents. Soon it was inferred that the satellite brought in an alien organism that caused the death of everyone, and Dr. Stone and surgeon Dr. Mark Hall were called in to investigate the matter. The team discovered that the town's doctor had a satellite in his office and he was dead with his blood crystallized into powder. It was eventually found that it was a microscopic alien organism termed Andromeda that caused the death of the townspeople. When inhaled by humans, Andromeda causes blood to clot instantly, leading to death. Each microbe contained hydrogen carbon and amino acids, which could develop into protein, DNA or RNA. Moreover, the microbes of the alien entity could transform matter into matter and could survive only in a short pH scale range. The alcoholic's blood was acidic, while a newborn's blood was highly alkalic, for which they were unaffected. While the team of scientists were joined by Dr. Charles Dutton and Dr. Ruth Leavitt, the wildlife facility was set with a nuclear explosion which would go off if the contaminating alien entity went out of hand. During the course of events, the entity seemed to be getting out of hand and wildlife facility was about to detonate the bomb, but thankfully Dr. Stone managed to stop it, following which it rained and cleansed the town of the alien entity. Andromeda was a high-budget film which managed to bag double the amount from the box office. Throughout the movie, the suspense was well developed, and the true artistry of the director Robert Wise was the way he used the split screen to showcase events running parallelly. Prometheus Prometheus was a sci-fi horror film co-produced and directed by Ridley Scott. The film begins with a spacecraft departing a planet where a humanoid alien drank a liquid and dissolved. Its remains cascade into a waterfall and the alien's DNA breaks down and recombines. Later, in 2089, archaeologists Elizabeth Shaw and Charlie Holloway discovered a star map in Scotland that matched others from several unconnected ancient 
different cultures. They interpret this to be an invitation from humanity's forerunner, known as the engineers. Soon, the elderly CEO of Wayland Corporation took the initiative and funded an expedition aboard the scientific vessel Prometheus to follow the map and travel to the distant moon LV-223. With the ship's crew in stasis mode and monitored by the android David, they arrived in December 2093. Upon investigating the barren lands, they found a mountainous surface near a large artificial structure that contained stone cylinders, a monolithic statue of a humanoid head and the corpse of a giant alien, which they believed to be the engineer. Soon they found corpses of other aliens, inferring them to have gone extinct. One of the crew members, David, carried one of the cylinders into Prometheus, which began leaking a black liquid. He tainted the drink of Charlie Holloway with the liquid. The remaining crew members went inside a giant complex structure adjacent to the monolith, where a snake-like creature attacked and killed one of them. The movie continues with the several crises faced by the crew members. Holloway was infected and when he had sex with Elizabeth Shaw, she became pregnant with a squid-like creature. David separately discovered a control room with a living engineer in stasis mode and a holographic map with Earth marked. Holloway was eventually killed and Shaw self-operated herself to remove the creature inside. Another crew member mutated into a vicious creature and attacked and killed members of the crew of Prometheus. When the engineer woke up from the stasis mode, it was revealed that the black liquid was a biological weapon that the engineer planned to unleash on Earth. Finally, the engineer was defeated and killed when Shaw, the only surviving member, released the alien creature that came from her abdomen on the engineer. The movie ended with an alien creature tearing its way out of the deceased engineer's chest. The film was later tied to the Alien franchise, serving as the perfect sequel to 2017's Alien Covenant. The film was highly praised for its cast, their performance, designs and, of course, its 3D cinematography. The film grabbed one's attention in the early minutes and the first hour of the film was terrific. The Man from Earth Directed by Richard Schenkman, The Man from Earth was an American sci-fi film showcasing an intellectual debate with a university professor named John Oldman, who claimed to have been born in the Paleolithic period or the Stone Age and lived for 14 millennia. The film begins with Professor John Oldman leaving his workplace and shifting to a new place. His colleagues Harry, a biologist, Dan, an anthropologist, Sandy, a historian, Art, an archaeologist, with his younger student Linda and Edith, an art history professor and devout Christian, planned to give him a farewell party. They all wanted to know the reason for his departure and pressed him to explain them. John stated his true age and explained that he frequently changed his workplace so that no one would spot that he did not age. None of his colleagues accepted the story and each began questioning from their point of study and observation. The movie continues with an exchange of thought-provoking dialogue and interpretations of life and humanity. With such a low budget of $200,000, The Man from Earth is a masterpiece, and David Lee Smith's performance in the role of Dr. Oldman was spectacular. The light and jovial setting of the film soon changed into a serious tone, when Oldman declared that according to his knowledge, he was the inspiration behind the story of Jesus. There was a burst of emotion in the room. In the end, Dr. Oldman declared that it was a prank, but only after things were getting out of hand. Robot and Frank Directed by Jake Schreerer, Robot and Frank was a sci-fi film showcasing a futuristic world in which robots could perform multiple tasks, including caring for the old and sick. The story is about an aging ex-convict, Frank Weld, suffering from dementia. Unable to visit his father regularly, Frank's son, Hunter, purchased a robot companion for his father. It was a highly advanced robot that provided therapeutic care, including maintaining a regular routine for the old and providing cognition-enhancing activities like gardening. Frank soon bonded with his new companion and realized that the robot was not programmed to understand the difference between recreational and criminal activities. 
Society. Using the robot's knowledge, Frank planned to perform a robbery. He wanted to impress the local librarian and hence stole an antique copy of Don Quixote from the library, which was being renovated and turned into a community center as the craze for print media was no more. The two performed another robbery where they stole jewelry from the head of the library renovation project. The police got involved but failed to catch Frank as it was hard to believe an old man with dementia committing a crime. Frank's fun came to an end when his health deteriorated further and he was made to erase the robot's memory in order to remove all traces of the crime. Frank was finally taken into a full-time care unit where he called his son and informed him that the jewelry was hidden underneath the tomato plants in the garden that the robot had made. Along with a talented cast, the film succeeds for its beautifully crafted storyline. The cinematography stands out and well connects to its audience emotionally. In the scene where Frank went ahead to erase the robot's memory, it pleaded with Frank not to. The robot stated that its sole purpose was to take care of Frank and since he was not a human, he would try his best to prevent him from going to jail. The entire scene was touching and a well-deserved conclusion. Arrival from 2016 2016's Arrival is a movie focusing on aliens trying to join hands with humans for mutual benefit. Directed by Denis Villeneuve, the story revolved around the 12 extraterrestrial spacecraft hovering at different locations and linguist Louise Banks, who has been recruited by United States U.S. Army Colonel Weber to help them communicate with the aliens. Banks and another recruit, physicist Ian Donnelly, were sent to the alien spacecraft where two cephalopod-like seven-limbed aliens appeared and seemed to communicate with them. They called them heptopods and Donnelly nicknamed the two Abbott and Costello. The heptopods made complex designs which seemed confusing but when they returned to their base and studied them, they managed to crack it. The complex language consisted of palindromic phrases written with circular symbols. While studying them, Banks began having visuals of her daughter Hannah. At the beginning of the movie, we see Hannah dying in her mother's arms and it can be clearly inferred to be events from the distant future. While some nations decoded the phrases to be offered as offer weapons, China interpreted the phrases as use weapons and broke off communications and several countries followed them. Amidst the hostility and rising tension, Donnelly discovered that the symbol for time was present throughout the message and the writing occupied one twelfth of the 3D space into which it was projected. As the movie progressed, it was revealed that the aliens understood time from a non-linear perspective and could look into the future, for which Banks had visuals of a daughter. They wanted to help humanity as they would need help from humanity after 3,000 years. However, they would teach them their perspective of time after they share the information with the world. Finally, China shared their twelfth of the message and the aliens left. Donnelly and Banks fell in love and married despite knowing that their daughter would be born with an incurable disease and dying soon. Arrival is one of the movies which blends their cinematography, background score and performance into an organic magnificence. From brilliant performances by the cast, the film is effectively crafted and a must-watch for sci-fi lovers. Ex Machina from 2014 Next on the list, we have 2014's Ex Machina, written and directed by Alex Garland in his directorial debut. The film provides a spine-chilling suspense and showcases the dangers of AI. The story begins with Caleb Smith, a programmer at the Blue Book Search Engine Company, winning an office contest. As a reward, he would be taken for a one-week visit to the grand residence of the CEO, Nathan Bateman. The house was isolated and only Nathan lived there with his mute servant Kyoko. Caleb was called in for a purpose. Nathan revealed to him about his newest creation, a humanoid robot with artificial intelligence named Ava and wanted Caleb to test if she was genuinely capable of thought processing. As Caleb and Ava were left alone, the two grew close and Ava, blocking the cameras and recording devices, stated that Nathan was a wicked liar who could not be trusted. 
Later, Caleb learns that Kyoko is also a humanoid android and despises Nathan for his deeds. When he confronted Nathan, he explained that this was all a test and Ava indeed passed the test. She developed the ability to manipulate. However, Caleb hindered Nathan's plans and helped the two androids. At the end of the movie, the two androids impale Nathan to death and after trapping Caleb in a room, they leave and blend with the world outside. Ex Machina is an intelligent film that is beautifully crafted and explained. The visual effects were fantastic and so was the screenplay. The Martian from 2015 The sci-fi movie Martian was a film showcasing the struggles of an astronaut being accidentally left on Mars. Directed by Ridley Scott, the movie was a huge hit and received several awards and immense profits at the box office. The film opens in the year 2035 when the crew of Ares 3's mission to Mars are exploring Acidalia Planitia on Martian solar day. A severe dust storm soon interrupts their mission, forcing them to retreat immediately. Amidst the chaos, one of the crewmates, Mark Watney, played by Matt Damon, was considered dead and left behind. When Mark regained consciousness, he found his suit's oxygen running low and immediately returned to the crew's surface habitat. After treating his injuries, he realized that there were no means of communicating with Earth, and his only chance of survival was to wait for the next Mars mission in four years. The film continues with his struggles to survive the harsh conditions and also traveling to the location where the next mission crew members would be landing. Mark synthetically produced water and grew potatoes for food. When NASA satellite planner Mindy Park from Earth noticed the satellite images of moved equipment on Mars, she deduced Mark to be alive. They managed to communicate with Mark via text and made ways to rescue him. Meanwhile, the China National Space Administration devised a new booster rocket that could take their team to Mars in two years instead of four. Together, they managed to arrive on Mars and rescue Mark, who was barely keeping up with the planet's harsh conditions. The film is a magnum opus, and the way they crafted complex ideas that seemed understandable and easy is commendable. It is a visual delight for sci-fi lovers with amazing effects and background score, for which it remains on the list of must-watch movies. Children of Men from 2006 Based on P. D. James's 1992 novel of the same name, The Children of Men was a sci-fi film showcasing the futuristic world of 2027, where two decades of human infertility had led to the collapse of society. The United Kingdom had become a police state and immigrants were arrested to be imprisoned or killed. However, it was the only civilized state for which people worldwide tried making their way into the nation. Government bureaucrat Theo Farron, who was once an activist, learned about his ex-wife Julian Taylor's terrorist organization named Fishes after being kidnapped by them. They had parted ways after their son died due to the 2008 flu pandemic. The Fishes stood against the irrational killing of immigrants and Julian wanted Theo's help to pass in a young immigrant woman named Key who needed to go to the East Coast. Theo agreed and the movie progressed with the three journeying to the East Coast while facing numerous crises and surprises. The film is a high-intensity package of thrill and excitement crafted by director Alfonso Cuaron. It has a thought-provoking message knit carefully that left audiences awestruck. Gattaca from 1997. Next on our list, we have 1997's Gattaca, a sci-fi thriller film directed by Andrew Nicol. Gattaca is a film that showcases a futuristic world where society is discriminated against on the basis of eugenics. Although genetic discrimination was against the law, genotype profiling was used in every field, including employment. They were the valids who held a better place in society and the naturally conceived invalids who were susceptible to genetic disorders and hence given menial jobs. The story is about Vincent Freeman who was naturally conceived and hence an invalid. His parents were unhappy and used genetic selection for their second child, Anton Jr., who turned out to be a valid. Although Anton was physically abler than Vincent, the latter had an unbreakable will. 
Vincent dreamt of a career in space travel, which was only reserved for a valet. He ended up getting a job as a cleaner in office spaces, including that of Gattaca Aerospace Corporation. An interesting turn of events took place when Vincent got to pose as a valet using the donated hair, skin, blood and urine samples from former swimming star Jerome Eugene Morrow and gained employment at Gattaca as a navigator for their mission to Saturn's moon Titan. Vincent's natural defect would cause him to die of a heart defect at 30 years old, and his main thrill was how he tried to maintain his identity. In the end, when all samples of Jerome were exhausted, just before the final genetic check to travel, Dr. Lamar revealed that he knew Vincent was an invalid and let him pass the checky. Vincent had surpassed his validity with his sheer willpower and hard work, and Vincent Vincent's dream finally came true. The film ends in a happy tone and leaves a profound message as well. The visuals and background are well blended and the film maintains suspense. Blade Runner from 1982. 1982's Blade Runner showcases a dystopian world of 2019, where there were bioengineered humanoid androids called replicants hidden amongst humans. The story begins with Los Angeles police officer Rick Deckard being detained by Officer Gaff and examined if he was a real human or a replicant. The Blade Runners were the ones whose task was to identify the replicants and retire them. The present Blade Runner Deckard was brought in by Bryant and informed that four more replicants were on Earth illegally and needed to be identified immediately. Bryant showed Deckard a video of the previous Blade Runner, Holden, and how he distinguished the replicants on the basis of emotional responses. As one of the replicants, Leon shot and killed Holden. Bryant wanted Deckard to find Leon along with three other Nexus 6 replicants, Roy Batty, Zora, and Pris, immediately. The film continued with Deckard hunting down the replicants and terminating them, also gaining new information. The film is, again, a fantastic sci-fi film to watch. Director Ridley Scott beautifully crafted this masterpiece, and the way they blended mythological and biblical references is highly commendable. Sunshine 2007 Sunshine is a sci-fi movie showcasing a future where the sun is about to die out and bring humanity to an end. In 2050, a human space mission named Icarus had been initiated to travel to the sun and reignite it. However, Icarus failed and vanished, following which, seven years later, Icarus 2 had been initiated. The movie continues with a team making one last attempt to save humanity. During their travel, when they crossed Mercury, they received a distress signal from Icarus 1. After a long debate among the crew members, they decided to approach Icarus 1, which later came at the cost of losing a few crew members. Disputes arose and after a long struggle, the sun was reignited and humanity was saved. The film is an asset to the sci-fi genre and director Danny Boyle's work has been commendable. Brilliant performances by the cast and excellent cinematography make this movie one of the top sci-fi movies on our list. Stoker. Andrei Tarkovsky directed the 1979 Soviet science fiction art film Stoker, which was loosely based on the 1972 novel Roadside Picnic. The film was about the story of an expedition led by a mysterious unknown figure, the Stoker. The Stoker guided two clients, a professor and a melancholic writer, into a scientific discovery. The Stoker led them to a place called The Zone, where normal laws of physics were inapplicable. The area was secluded from the rest of the world and had a place called a room which granted the wish of anyone who stepped into it. The stalker begins his journey with the writer and the professor and after evading the military blockade, they manage to reach the zone via a railway work car. On their way, the writer revealed that his reason for going into the zone was to get back his inspiration and enhance his creativity, while the professor wanted to win a Nobel Prize. As the three entered the room, they eventually learned what happened to the previous 
and that the professor had brought explosives to destroy the place and prevent it from being accessed by evil men. After a verbal standoff, the professor gives up the idea to explode the place and they dismantle the bomb into pieces. Later, the three met back at the bar with the stalker's wife and daughter. Stalker states how humanity has degraded to live a good life needed for traversing the zone, following which their daughter pushed three drinking glasses across the table while dropping one of them. The film is a combination of science fiction and dramatic philosophical, psychological and theological themes that are understood and felt with the progression of the film. Its depth appeals to a mature audience and is a masterpiece. Wow. Minority Report from 2002 Have you ever imagined a world where criminals are prosecuted before they commit any crime? In that case, are they still criminals? Because prosecution is for committing a crime and not for thinking. 2002's Minority Report is a film that revolves around this concept as it showcases the dystopian future of 2054. After running their pre-crime police program for six years, the federal government plans to implement the program nationally. The process involves clairvoyant humans receiving psychic impressions of a crime, following which officers analyze their visions to locate and apprehend the perpetrator before he or she commits the crime. The would-be killers are then placed in an electrically induced coma and imprisoned in a panopticon-like facility. However, despite the program being able to eradicate crime completely, the Red Bull killings gave the authorities almost no time to act. Directed by Steven Spielberg, the film is loosely adapted from Philip K. Dick's 1956 novella The Minority Report and is an example of fine craftsmanship. The thrill that the film maintains throughout is spine-chilling, and Spielberg's take on such an intriguing concept is highly commendable. The plot revolves around pre-crime chief John Anderton, who joined the services after his six-year-old son Sean was abducted and never found. His wife, Lara, had left him, and to cope with his depression, he took the drug Neuroin, to which he was highly addicted to. As the story progressed, Anderton learned from Dr. Iris Heinemann, a geneticist whose research led to the creation of the pre-crime program, that the precog's abilities were a result of brain damage caused by their parents' addiction to impure forms of Neuroin that were available before. Heinemann also added that the precogs occasionally saw visuals of different in futures and all such records were hidden to showcase the program flawlessly. These different versions of the future were termed the Minority Report, and every precog retained them in their memories. The plot continues with Anderton's struggle to expose the pre-crime program while surviving the rampage of the Red Bull killers. In the end, he succeeded, and the program was shut, while he reunited with his wife and was about to have a second child. Mr. Nobody. Next on the list is 2009's Mr. Nobody, written and directed by Jaco van Dormel. The sci-fi drama showcases a futuristic, dystopian world of the year 2092, where humans have achieved quasi-immortality. The 118-year-old Nemo Nobody, played by Jared Leto, is the last mortal on Earth, and with a few days counting. Keen to know about the world before quasi-immortality, psychiatrists Dr. Feldheim used hypnosis to help Nemo recall his life. Nemo revealed his recollections from three points in his life at 9, 15 and 34. But the twist was that all memories diverged from several points to different life events. Nemo added that children knew what would happen to their lives before birth. But moments before conception, the angels of oblivion erased the child's memory. As a matter of coincidence, they had forgotten to do so for Nemo, for which he remembered different possible futures of his life. His life was constant until his parents planned to divorce when he was nine. Young Nemo was given the choice of choosing which parent he wanted to live with, and from that point, his choices traversed him through multiple possible futures. In a life 
when Nemo went aboard the train with his mother, he grew up to be a rebellious teenager who became attracted to a girl named Anna. While the two hung out at the beach, she asked Nemo to go for a swim with her friends, to which he insulted her, and they never met again. In another timeline, Nemo admitted that he could not swim, and the two grew their love and attraction for each other. She was the daughter of a mother's new boyfriend and fiancé, Harry. The two carried on their affair in secret until Anna had to leave for New York to her father. The two met again years later, but after Nemo lost the contact that she had given, the two never met. Nemo then narrated another life of his where he was married to Anna and had children. He worked as a narrator at a television studio and his life continued happily until an accident led to his demise. Nemo then began narrating his life in which he chose to stay with his father. In his teenage days, he worked in a shop and spent his free time writing a science fiction story about a journey to Mars. In this case, he fell in love with a girl named Elise, who he later knew had a 22-year-old boyfriend. Heartbroken, he rushed on his motorcycle, which led to an accident, leaving him in a vegetative state and his parents reunited. In another timeline, Nemo did not leave heartbroken after knowing of Elise's boyfriend, but in instead assured his feelings, to which Elise gave in, and they got married. In another timeline, Elise died on their wedding day, owing to an explosion, and Nemo carried her ashes to Mars. Continuing through his dreamscape, Nemo, in another version, was the narrator of the same television, and Anna was the widow of his colleague who died in an accident. Nemo next narrated the life where he had married Elise and had three children. However, Elise suffered from personality disorder order depression, which eventually led her to leave for her ex-boyfriend Stefano. In another timeline, when Nemo learned about Elise's boyfriend in his teenage days, he settled with a girl named Jean and married her. He was successful, rich, and bored. As he left all his wealth to lead a carefree life, he was murdered by a group of assassins. While puzzling through all the possibilities, Nemo is shown to be repeatedly awakening in a surrealistic environment consisting of argyle patterns. He followed clues and arrived at a house where a DVD player played an interactive video between 118-year-old Nemo and 34-year-old Nemo. The elderly Nemo revealed to his younger self that it was the universe where Nemo nobody was never born, and his consciousness was stuck in limbo. He also informed the 34-year-old Nemo of his date and time of death. Finally, Nemo spoke to the journalists that they are not real but a figment of the imagination of a nine-year-old Nemo choosing whom to stay with at the railway station. Simply terrific. Deep Impact from 1998. 1998's sci-fi film Deep Impact was an American science fiction disaster film directed by Mimi Leader and written by Bruce Joel Rubin and Michael Tolkien. The plot is about the desperate attempt of humanity to destroy a 7-mile or 11-kilometer long comet soon to collide with Earth and cause mass extinction. It all began in May 1998 when a high school student and amateur astronaut Leo Biederman noticed an unidentified object in the night sky. As he shared the details with astronomer Dr. Marcus Wolf, it was revealed that a comet was on its way to Earth and the collision would cause mass extinction. However, before he could raise the alarm, Marcus died in a car crash. A year later, when journalist Jenny Lerner investigated Secretary of the Treasury Alan Rittenhouse with regard to his secret affair with Ellie, she found him loading large amounts of food and survival gear for his family. She was soon arrested by the FBI and taken to meet President Tom Beck, who revealed that Ellie was not the name of a woman, but an acronym, ELE, -E, standing for an extinction level event that Earth would soon be facing. Two days later, President Beck revealed the news to the world and also that the United States and Russia had completed the construction of a giant spacecraft 
named Messiah, intended to transport a team to the comet who would alter the comet's path with the aid of massive nuclear explosions. As the film continued, the team of astronauts traveled to the comet and planted the bombs, facing numerous struggles. In their first attempt, they ended up splitting up the comet into two pieces instead of diverging its path. With hopes of surviving, martial law had been imposed to select individuals based on a lottery to take shelter in Missouri's limestone bluffs, which eventually brought down the world to utter chaos. The first fragment of the comet crashed into the Atlantic Ocean near Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, creating a massive tsunami that affected several places like Europe and Africa. However, before the larger fragment hit Earth, the crew members crashed their spacecraft into the comet and detonated all remaining nuclear bombs with them, thereby sacrificing their lives and saving humanity. Deep Impact is one of those films which narrates its story in close proximity to reality. The story is simple, with rational scientific explanations that are beautifully crafted into the idea of the film. The cinematography is fantastic, and the performance by the cast also fits perfectly. Existence, written and directed by David Robert Deranian, the 2020 sci-fi film Existence is the story of a dying young man, John, struggling to preserve his consciousness. John was a science enthusiast, diagnosed with a fatal disease that gave him a year to live at most. Determined not to seize his existence, John planned on putting his unproven research to the test. His work was about how to embed someone's consciousness onto the internet as an AI. John's wife, who was a first-year graduate student in anthropology, feared the outcome of his efforts but nevertheless gave him all the help he needed. John's best friend and a recent medical school passout, Tim Sterling, helped him fight the debilitating effects of his disease and John used all the time he had into the work. The movie progressed as John raced against death and worked to develop the AI, while his father, Henry, highly disapproved of the idea, considering it an act of making oneself equal to God. Despite having a slow start, the movie takes off after the second act. Braden Bullard, who plays the character of John, stood out from the rest and contributed to making the film a hit. conclusion. So we have finally come to the end of our video and we hope you have liked our list of movies. Feel free to add such deep, thought-provoking sci-fi films that we have missed in the comment section below. With that, we will be ending our video and stay tuned for the next marvelous video. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.